the best of the rest for year six of Nintendo Power. This time we're focusing our attention on a slew of movie licensed games and a trio of fighting games. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a rough game. The controls are more or less okay, but where things fall apart is the level design, and the fact that, bringing up my repeated beef with console titles of this era, there are limited continues in a title that was only designed for consoles. The developer, Psygnosis, does bring their sense of visual flair to the game, so while it doesn't quite capture the look of the movie the same way that something like, for example, Nosferatu would, it does have the same sense of place. The problem lies with the actual mechanical level design, with traps and levels that take too many lives to figure out, unfortunately. This is aggravated by the fact that the game has only two continues on normal difficulty, and easy difficulty stops at the first four levels. Cliffhanger's greatest sin is being boring. It's not that it's particularly inept, or that it's any sort of interesting failure, it's just boring. It's a movie license being turned into a fairly generic brawler, but doesn't bring anything to the table. Now, The Lawnmower Man, on the other hand, is an interesting failure of a game. On the one hand, a bunch of action sequences that play like they're right out of an Amiga game, which would be okay if it wasn't for the fact that you die on the hit, and you have both limited lives and limited continues, making for onerous but otherwise playable action sequences. And then we have flying sequences where you're moving through a virtual space in which are visually engaging, especially for the NES. However, again, because of the live and continue limits, making learning and mastering the sequences is rather onerous. There's an Unlimited Lives code, but I was never quite able to pull it off. I can imagine using a similar Damn Genie or Proxy Replay code can work as well, and that would certainly definitely make this game more playable. It wouldn't necessarily make it completely good, but it would make it more playable. Now, Beethoven's second is dog crap, if you'll forgive the semi pond The level designs are incredibly simplistic, but they're also made excessively difficult by a very weak attack for your character, and the fact that Beethoven has a inertia that turns every level into an ice level. And then just to put the cherry on top of the peak of Sunday, the game uses a type base for the in-game text that manages to be worse and more obnoxious than Comic Sans. Baby's Kids is a beat-em-up video game based on an animated film, based on a stand-up comedy routine by comedian Robin Harris, who passed away while the film was in production, so he wasn't able to have any major input on that film, which was in turn critically panned, nor was he able to have any input on this game, which was also critically panned. I said panning was absolutely justified. The controls of this game are incredibly sluggish, and the range of the attack animations are very short in comparison to the enemies you're fighting. While yes, you are controlling kids, and kids can't, don't have a very long reach compared to adults, there are ways to get around this. With the Simpsons arcade game, while Bart and Lisa are also kids and have a short reach, they are given weapons that extend their reach and make them more effective in combat. Like, for example, Bart's skateboard. The thing is, though, the concept is decent for a video game. A group of kids terrorize a theme park, taking on the guards who are out to stop them. Honestly, I could see this even being a better concept for a game than it was for a concept for a movie, basically turning this into a mashup of Final Fight and Rampage, but this isn't that. It's a instead a really poorly done game in almost every respect. Now, this on a semi-related topic, Dennis the Menace is a game that's way bigger than it needs to be. The world of the game levels is too large and aimless to be particularly fun. The levels are less exciting to experience and more boring. It's not even particularly interesting to talk about. The Untouchables plays like a bad arcade port. You have several levels with an incredibly short time limit of one minute or less. Some levels have power-ups that extend your time limit to the level, but otherwise you have one minute, giving little to no margin for error in the game. It's a bloody obnoxious mess, and it takes a game that could have been, at the very least, decent, and makes it absolutely unplayable. Moving on to fighting games. World Heroes is a very different fighting game from Samurai Showdown, Fatal Fury, or Street Fighter. It's a game where characters have double jumps and are generally designed in a more flashy map. It's a little faster, but not a lot faster, than those other games. It's not quite a straight-up precursor of games like Capcom's Versus series, but you can see 
where the lineage from here, which is particularly of note because this isn't from Capcom. It's a port of an SNK title, but adapted by Sunsoft. I'd say that World Heroes is probably the big series from SNK's back catalog that really fell under the radar, which is a shame because I think it's a title that could stand for a renaissance. Ranma One Half is a fighting game with the, some serious mechanical flaws, but a ton of character. Let's get the bad news out of the way first. This is a fighting game that only really uses four buttons in the controller, with a designated jump button as one of the face buttons, and uses the shoulder buttons as designated attack buttons, with two additional face buttons loose, used for light and heavy attacks. It makes for a fighting game that doesn't really control well, especially compared to other games out there. But that said, it nails the tone of the anime and manga really well. There are not over-the-top stakes in this game. Instead, each character's motivation fits in what they want for their character in the show. Whether it's Ranma not having to take tests anymore and just have to no longer worry about his grades, and particularly his great sufferings due to his interactions with the Kuno family, or for Akane not to get that harassed by students anymore or anything like that. It, even the game over scenes are absolutely fantastic. And the cutscenes all just work together really well to give this presentation where it fits within the context of the work in a way that a lot of other anime licensed games don't necessarily do. Continuing with fighting games, Art of Fighting has similar problems to Ramon One Half, though this comes from the fact that this is a part of a Neo Geo game, and the Neo Geo arcade cabinet has a limited number of buttons. That said, Art of Fighting doesn't use those buttons wisely, with one punch and kick button the third being used for a taunt, which is somewhat useful, but less useful than a designated grab button, for example, would be. At least they don't have a designated jump button. I'll give them that. Other than that, the game's difficulty is balanced around the fact that this is the port of an arcade game. Or rather, it's not balanced to reflect that this is a home port, port so your game wants to, the game wants to eat your quarters, even though you have no quarters to give it. Now, we do have unlimited continues, which is nice, but it's still a shame because this game has a designated story mode, which is hampered by the game's lack of a balance, or rebalance, right? Lamborghini American Challenge is a fun enough racing game in the style of Rad Racer, but it's a little monotonous when it comes to the music. This is a problem because it's a racing game, and it's a racing game with a lot of tracks that you're going to be going through. In some cases, possibly multiple times, so you're going to be hearing this song over and over again. It's fun, though. I enjoyed playing it, but the music aspect of things and a few other aspects makes it less special in terms of something where I want to give it a full-throated recommendation. Depending. Super Chase HQ is a pretty straightforward port of the arcade version with some overhaul issues to the graphics that up the frustration factor. First, there are two continues and no lives, so you only have three chances to beat the game. The Japanese version has this as well. However, for some reason, the US version has a first person perspective. From, by comparison, from what I remember of seeing the Japanese version in Game Center CX, the Japanese version uses a third person perspective, which makes maneuvering and getting side on hits on your opponent's car is much easier. It wasn't for the fact that getting the true ending is harder on the Japanese version, and considering that you don't actually need to know Japanese to get the game, I'd almost recommend playing the Super Famicom version instead of the Super Nintendo version. Mega Man Soccer is interesting because it's a, effectively a pretty straightforward soccer game, but the difference being that your team is made up of robots and you play through the game getting various robot masters to join your team as your team is made up entirely of that one robot master instead of having players with just separate stats on their own. It's an interesting concept because your opponent's team is, all, again, all made up of the same kind of robot master, while your team starts out as just Mega Man but will develop variety as the game goes on, allowing for a different degree of strategic gameplay. I'd consider this game greatly underrated if it wasn't for the fact that a copy of this will run you $60 for approximately for a loose copy as of this recording. SOS is a cinematic action adventure game, and it's an interesting one. It takes the concept of the Poseidon adventure and tries to make an adventure platformer out of it. It controls well enough, but as I saw when it was played on Game Center CX, 
The game's biggest weakness is the AI. In order to get the best ending, you have to get all the survivors out of the ship, plus a specific survivor for each character. And the ones you don't control follow you under the control of the computer, which is not great at platforming. It is possible to get the best ending. They did it on the show. But it's incredibly hard to do, and it's not because of the difficulty of the actions the player is asked to perform, but rather the actions that the player has to take to trick the AI into doing the things that it needs to do in order to get you that score. That's not cool, and that makes it almost impossible for me to recommend. My pick of the episode is Lamborghini American Challenge. The music is lackluster, but nowadays, well, that's what turned down the music in the game and putting on Spotify, or even back in the day, putting on a CD or a vinyl album or whatever tape is for. Next time, we return back to our regularly scheduled Nintendo Power coverage as we start the next year of the magazine. And as we get closer, slowly but surely, to the Nintendo 64. See you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 